All right. Good morning. Hope everybody is having a nice Sunday. It is morning here in San Diego. Um, and it's a really nice, pretty sunny day. All right. And just did a refresher just to make sure everything was showing up on your guys' side nicely. Excellent. So this is Paint with Lovejoy. And today's painting is going to be a really cute and colorful tree frog. Um, this one's going to be fun. So a little bit of what you're looking at. I am working on an 8x10 panel. Some of you may be working on a thicker stretched canvas. So when we get to the edges for our color on the thicker canvases, I recommend that you wrap that color around the edge. But I'm on an 8x10 canvas today or panel today. And the line drawing that you see on the panel already, you've got two options here. You can pause the video, draw what you see, and then pick up the video where uh, you left off. Or, um, and it's already uploaded, there's a link in the description box below. You can check out what I call a traceable. It'll take you to the website. You can purchase the traceable, download it, print it out. And then with carbon paper, you can transfer it to your canvas. And for my first time in beginner painters, this is a nice tool to utilize. So that way you don't have to stress about drawing and you can jump right in and focus on painting. Um, but either option you choose, um, just get your initial composition on there and then pick up the video for the painting portion. All right, so let's see, we've got a few of you jumping on. Hi, V. Hi, Denise. And hi, Photography Queen. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And yes, uh, this one is going to be really, really cute. Even my cats are hanging out and enjoying watching the painting process. I'm waiting for one of them to jump on my table and disrupt the video. That might happen one day. Okay, so what we're going to do today this is going to be a red-eyed tree frog, so we've got bright red eyes, kind of light green, orange little hands, and he is hanging out on leaves. So these two are going to be leaves, and I'm going to put a blue background, a blue sky background right here. So we'll start with that, then we'll work on our leaves and kind of go color by color and just jump around. All right, so I am using the small middle flat brush, and you can use your brush based on what size canvas you have. So if you're on a bigger canvas, you're going to use a bigger brush. And I'm going for kind of a medium blue. So I'm going to pull some of the white aside, pull some of the blue into it, and get to a shade that I want my sky to be. And I'm going for about a middle blue. You are more than welcome to switch up and change the color. If you want to do it green instead, it would be like your tree frog is hanging out, um, you know, in all the leaves and we can't see any of the sky but I wanted an extra color in mine, so that's why he's getting the blue sky behind him. So we're basically going to be going from the edges of our frog to the edges of the canvas, kind of filling up all that space. And as you're applying your paint, try a few different brush strokes. Maybe try a different brush stroke if you've kind of stuck with the same one for your last three paintings. Try something different, because that's the only way you can change your style, evolve and adapt by trying things that you haven't done in the past. Now, if you paint anything that you don't like, or you paint your background on the inside of your pet or of your animal, um, just let it dry and then you can paint right on top of it again. So with acrylic paint, there is a lot of wiggle room and a lot of um, uh, things that will help for being a first time or beginner painter. All right. And I'm going to keep this one pretty much the, uh, the same shade. I'm not going to do too much wet on wet blending like I've done in some of the other demos. But if you want an area that's going to be a little lighter or darker, um, you can pick up some of your darker paint or your white, slap it on there. Here, I'll do a little bit with the white. I feel bad explaining it and not doing it. So you could throw a little bit of that white on there, wipe off that brush, and then you just kind of blend that new color into uh, that base paint. So this is kind of a fun thing to play with. And then if you do what I just did, where you moved your brush a lot and you end up doing a lot of blending and you lose that color transition, just repeat the process and only move your brush a handful of times. All right. And I guess we're kind of keeping with the uh, kind of poppy colors that I've done in the last three demos with the greens and the blues. And then that red's going to be a nice kind of accent color along with the orange. And this one will work um, 
on a complementing scale as well because you've got your orange that will go on here and then our blue background and we've got dual complements so we'll have the red eyes and then the green um, for the leaves and the green of the body so good choice today all right hi mike hi rhonda excellent excellent Okay, so let's see. Denise is asking if you have an 8x10 canvas uh, for the tra transfer, do you need to reduce it by 80%? Um, <clears throat> depending on what your printer actually does when you print it out, um, you're printing on an 85 by 11 sheet. So perfect for an 11 by 14 where you'll have a little extra where you have to draw the lines. So, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. Kind of surprised me. Um, but for your eight and a half, eight by 10 canvas, um, when you're printing it, maybe choose the option to where it doesn't print to the border, or if you actually have the option on your printer, um, to print an eight by 10. And I think you can do a five by seven and even a four by six. So choose that specific eight by 10 option and it'll shrink it to the right size for you. And then same on the opposite. If you want to paint on a larger canvas, if you want a nine by 12 or 16 by 20 or 24 by 24, you can take that traceable. You will have to edit it on your own, but you can upsize it. Um, and for an, uh, a 16 by 20, what I actually do is I'll put the whole image in the computer at that size, and then I break it up into four sheets that would be printable. And then you overlap the sheets, line everything up, and then I have a huge 16 by 20, and then I just go and transfer and move my carbon paper as needed. So you can go both directions with the traceable. All right, let's see, we've got another question. My paint dries so fast, or you paint too slow. No, it's okay. Um, so you don't get the chance to blend it. Okay, so I will address that question. I'm gonna go ahead and start making the green, and then we'll talk about um, the drying time of paint. So to make our green, um, we're gonna do a mixture of green and yellow. We're gonna start with kind of a darker green for these two leaves. And then we're kind of going to go back to that Yoda color, that yellow with just a touch of green for kind of the, the lime green on our frog. So first we're going to get the base on here. So I'm going to start with yellow, add a little bit of green, and that was more than a little, sorry about that. But we're going for about a middle green, more green than yellow, because there's going to be more yellow than green when we get to the frog. Okay, so that's a pretty good color and I'll probably have to mix that a few times. So don't stress about getting the exact same mixture each time. All right, so the question about paint drying. There's a few factors in how quickly or how slowly your paint um, is going to dry. <clears throat> the first one is the type of paint that you are buying, what brand of paint. Um, there is craft paint, which is pretty cheap. I think you can pick them up for under $2, and they come in a huge variety of colors. Those are meant to go on metal, plastic, wood, canvas, but they're meant for what's considered um, folk art painting. And it's not really, there's not a whole lot of blending that's usually done with them, and they do tend to dry very, very quickly. So you have less workability and less blending time with it. Um, same with some student grade acrylics, which is going to be like a next step up from using the craft paint. Some of your student grade acrylics uh, will dry extra fast um, compared to others. So I'm using student grade acrylics right now, and you can see that they're kind of transparent. We'll actually get a second layer on there. <clears throat> and this particular brand, I'm using Chroma Acrylics. The closest thing in the States to what you can buy for chrome and acrylics is Liquitex Basics. And <clears throat> Liquitex Basics is going to have about 20, 15 to 20 minutes of dry time, so you'll have good workability with it. Some of the other brands, like I did actually try the Blix uh, student grade brand. They dried in like 15 minutes, and I couldn't get my class to do some of the blending that they needed because it dried too quickly. <clears throat> You can add what they call extenders to acrylic paint. I'm not quite sure if you can add those to the folk art paint, um, but you can add extenders to make it dry even slower. So go to Michael's or Blix or your art store 
and tell them kind of what you're looking for and then you can look at different pricing because based on the brand your pricing will be different and then on the top of the line artist grade paint are much more expensive um, you'll get a lot longer workability time with it and then if you especially if you move into oils you'll get a lot longer working time um, but they're going to be a nicer consistency richer in colors and more opaque coverage compared to the student grade paint so like i said we're going to do a second coat on this so hopefully that kind of answered um, your question it was kind of like i said it was a loaded there's a lot of variables that go into dry time all right so the green that i'm using that was the next question hi kyla um, this is for the chroma acrylics brand this is what they call a cool or a deep green um, let's see, probably a hunter green, the other dark one, and it's the one that I usually recommend on the videos, there's a hooker's green, um, and I do not remember exactly why it's called that, um, but those are going to be a much darker green. So you will notice that between different brands, and I'm just putting a second coat on here uh, while I'm talking, you'll notice that between the different brands, um, you'll find different variations in each color. Kind of like blue, there's cerulean blue, ultramarine blue, phthalo blue, and each one of them have slightly different characteristics um, for their actual color, as well as for how they'll mix. Like the phthalo, you can get a blue phthalo, uh, green that has a hint of blue, or you can get a green hint or a tint of red. Like there's a lot of subtle variations that as you get more into painting, that you'll start finding the brands the specific colors and the specific things that you like for your creative process. So sorry, that wasn't the exact green answer you were looking for. All right, so even just putting the second coat on kind of quick, you can see where it's a little bit more opaque. We are gonna do some of that wet on wet blending with yellow and the direct green. Nice. Hi, Stephanie. Yes, and I agree um, The ultramarine blue is very pretty. Uh, lime green, Kyla, lime green is good, and that will be closer to the color that we'll be using for our frog. So if you're using lime green for your leaves, add some blue to it, um, and that will make it a touch darker and cooler. I'm trying to think. It shouldn't change the color too much, especially depending on what shade of blue that you have. But give it a try. This is how you're going to learn with what your colors at home actually do. Okay, so now I'm grabbing that direct green. We're going to slap this on a few places and then I'm going to go back and blend it. So I'm going to put it on um, kind of just bold. So as you are at home watching the video, I want you to just notice the place that I'm putting this. And then I'm going to talk about how we're going to blend it in in just a moment. So I am putting it around his little fingers because we're imagining that he's making a shadow on the leaf as his fingers are coming over. And then even on our actual leaf, there are some different spots that are a little bit darker. So I'm just kind of slapping that on there. I'm going to wipe the brush off, wipe off all that excess paint. And then with a light pressure, I'm just going to kind of soften that new color into the base color. And we're going to do the same thing um, with yellow paint. Now, as I'm doing this, because I want to kind of keep my brush strokes a little more smooth, I am kind of holding my brush at that 45 degree angle and using the side of the bristles compared to using just the tips and holding it perpendicular because you see the bristles are actually cutting back to my canvas. So again, I'm trying to leave that thickness and holding my brush sideways to help perpetuate that. And as you're blending, if you're inclined to blend with your fingers, go for it. There's nothing better than getting messy with paint. All right, so I'm gonna wipe off that excess paint. I'm gonna grab some yellow. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna put it on the kind of the edge. We have a nice little highlight here. And same thing like we did with the green. I'm just gonna slap it on there. Let's put a little bit over here and then blend it in. So, if you have paint that is drying really fast, maybe just work on just this section. Put your base of green, put your dark, and then your light. 
So if you know your paint's gonna go fast, just work in smaller sections, and then maybe you just do this section, then maybe you just do this one, um, but try to change what you need to based on what your tools and materials are doing. And that's part of the creative process as well. Um, getting creative and working with the variables for that particular given time. Okay. Awesome. Yes, and you can use a sponge for touch-ups. You can use your fingers. You can use pretty much anything. Um, whatever you're feeling comfortable with. If you want to use the back end of the knife or back end of the brush to make little dots, um, you can check out some of my other videos. And we use knives, and I use them kind of in an untraditional matter. It's just a matter of just, just get creative. Like I said, I don't care if you are finger painting, just get creative because our world is not getting any less stressful anytime soon. So it truly is up to you to find your creative outlets. Okay, so we're gonna move into our lime green color. And it's like I said, it's gonna be similar to that Yoda color we made a couple demos ago. Uh, we're gonna start with the yellow, add a touch of green. Awesome, and I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. Looks like I'm all caught up. Excellent. All right, so since this is pretty dark um, already, I'm actually just gonna take that yellow, push it on the side, and then I'm gonna pull some from this color to mix it into the green to get to that lemony lime green color. And you may end up pulling in more. There we go, now it's starting to change. I want a little bit more green, so I'm going to add just a touch more. All right, and you will notice that maybe one way um, on your canvas, this may look a little more yellow, or on your plate, it may look a little more yellow, and then when we go to here, it's going to look a little bit more green. Um, so just kind of play with how you're interpreting colors, um, what you're recognizing about a color. And we interpret our colors based on the color next to it. So your color, when you mix it, may look one way here. And then when you apply it on your canvas, um, you might go, ah, that's not the color I mixed. So if you have to adjust your color after you apply it to your canvas, don't be afraid to do that. Totally okay to adjust um, at any point in the creative process. Um, sometimes you may get to the end of a project and realize you have to start over because you've decided to do something different. Um, I think I remember when Toy Story 3 came out, they got almost to the end and then made a major change and had to go back and um, refilm and re-edit, redo, I think what was it, like 80% of the movie. So that is part of the creative process, just constantly refining and switching up what you need. And I tend to kind of just stick with the same brush, especially as I'm talking, I'm uh, kind of working both sides of my brain, being creative and logical to explain what I'm doing to you guys. Um, so with that, I tend to forget to grab the other brush. So if you need to grab that small pointy brush to get into little nooks and crannies, go right ahead and do that. Just because I don't grab the brush doesn't mean you can't. And most things in art, uh, like I've said before, are merely suggestions. It is up to you to find your groove of what you are doing. All right, so just looking for the other little spots. We're gonna throw some darker green in here. Um, and I do recommend doing two coats on this. Again, just because it is on the transparent side. Let's see, it goes all the way into here. And this one actually shoots all the way down to his arm, there we go. All right, so for this one, I am actually gonna grab the small pointy brush because I'm gonna take a little bit more green. And I am just grabbing that green directly. So we're gonna do the same thing that we did on the leaf. I'm gonna place this in a few areas and then we're gonna blend it in. So again, at home, just notice where I place this color, mimic it to the best of your ability on your canvas and be nice to yourself. I'm proud of you for painting at home. It does take a lot of courage to do this. And by doing this and finding your success in it, 
hopefully it will help other things in your life and career when you go, oh, I'm kind of scared, that's weird. But the fact that you did it in painting, hopefully it gives you enough courage to uh, step out of your comfort zone in other areas of your life. All right, so now that I've got the green on there, clean that brush. And you do want to do this while your paint is wet. So again, if you have that fast drying paint, just do this section and then go up and do the other section. So you might have to watch the video to see how a few sections go and then go back and adjust so you can work with your paint that's drying a little faster. And I'm just using kind of light pressure and just kind of smushing this um, darker green into the lighter green and kind of just pulling that shade away from the initial place where we laid this color. And as you're doing this, get in the habit of stepping out of your chair, um, looking at your painting from a distance of about five to 10 feet away and assessing if the adjustments that you're making are beneficial. Do you need to go in and change it? Do you need your highlight lighter or darker? But you are conversing with your canvas. There is no right or wrong conversation with it. Um, but you're just learning how you work, how you look at things, how you're applying and be kind to yourself. All right, so now I'm actually just grabbing a little bit of yellow because my paint is starting to dry on this side. So I'm using a little bit of that yellow just to kind of soften the color and blend in. And again, each one of you is gonna find your own balance with blending. And it is something that will change the more that you paint. All right, let's do a little more blending here. And then we're gonna start moving into some of our other colors for our frog. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait for the leaf to dry a little bit more before we do those orange little fingers. All right, so we got a few more questions. Um, let's see, my yellow is just a cool yellow. And again, that's through the chroma acrylics. And Stephanie's asking, what is the difference between primary red, kind of like your primary colors, red, blue, yellow, compared to phthalo blue, cad red, etc. Okay. Um, I was trying to think of the best way to answer that. So give me a moment while I come up with our next color. So we're going to do a little bit of blue for the leg and the arm. And then we've kind of got a creamy color and then we'll do the orange for the eyes and the fingers. Okay, so primary colors, um, and each brand has a different, uh, I guess, version of what they would call for primary colors. Let's see, we're gonna go blue. So we're going for kind of a light blue first. We'll start with white, add a tiny amount of blue, going lighter than what we did for our background. All right, so your primary colors, um, they're kind of basic and because they want to keep it pretty simple, they are going to use a pretty bright red like that. They'll actually use a little bit lighter blue, and then the yellow is usually pretty bright like that. Um, between different brands and their primary colors, you may see a little variety. The red could be a little brighter, a little darker. Same with the blue. The yellow is pretty, pretty much the same on quite a few of them. Um, and then the difference where you get with cad red um, cad red used to be made with cadmium, uh, which is not healthy for you. So I don't believe they're being made that way anymore. Um, and that cadmium was a, um, a natural ingredient and that's what gave it the color. And then for like phthalo blues, I forgot exactly how phthalo, um, blues are made and where the term phthalo comes from. So you might have to do a little research, um, on your own for that. Sorry. Um, but for the phthalos, there's going to be phthalo with a tint of blue, phthalo with a tint of red, phthalo with a tint of green. And if you get more into the painting process, and especially if you're going to paint with oils and do plein air painting, um, knowing the difference between a phthalo red hint, phthalo blue with a red hint, phthalo blue with a green hint, those will mix um, different for your colors. And when you're painting plein air, sometimes you have to get a muted color. And the more that you paint, the more you understand what your cad red's going to look like, what your yellow oxide's going to look like when it mixes. So it's just more variety 
and they come from the names come from back in the day of how what minerals and natural elements they had to use to mix to make those and based on the natural elements you got different um, variations within the paint same with even the gener um, geographical location where that paint might have been made and came from you'll get slightly different variations so long-winded answer for that it still comes down to what are you finding comfortable what do you want to use and what do you know how to work with start there and then just constantly you'll add to um, your repertoire all right okay so going with a little bit darker blue and kind of going around the areas that i was just placing it so these are good questions today um, you guys have made me think a lot more than i normally do during these paintings um, but i'm also realizing how much talking affects how i paint too so it's been it's been very very interesting and i thoroughly enjoyed doing these demos and I will keep them up until circumstances or things change. So again, with that medium blue, just kind of placing it um, around and even slightly blending into that light blue that we placed a moment ago. And I'm gonna go one shade darker and then we're gonna move into the chest colors on our little frog. So to go a little bit darker, just take that same pile. You're adding more blue and I am going pretty dark. He's got a pretty deep blue leg right here and I do want to make sure that it's darker than that background and we've got a little bit of it hanging up in here kind of in the crease that little elbow crease all right and if you guys do have other questions, please feel free to ask. I didn't mean to make that to stop the questions. Okay, so we're going to go into kind of the creamy part right here. And we're going to use white. We're going to kind of make it some shades of gray. So we're going to start with a medium gray, get the shades in there, and then lighter gray, and then a little bit of that pure white. So just kind of pushing some white off onto a clean spot. A uh, little bit of black goes a long way, so I like to load up my brush, kind of make a little pile right here, and then start mixing with the white. And that's actually pretty close to the color I need. Sometimes you get it right on the first mix, sometimes you got to adjust. So that one was pretty good. And it may be a touch darker than I need. So again, here we're going to be putting our darkest shadows in first, and then we'll work our way backwards. And again, I'm just going to create kind of little abstract shapes with these. This is what helps us create this illusion of a 3D object, 3D animal on our flat 2D surface. And as you're doing these, just kind of play with the pressure of your brush. Have fun with it. And as I'm looking at it, this needed to be green. So we'll be adding green to that in a moment. All right, so we're going to go a little bit lighter from there. So I'm going to grab a little bit more of that white, place it on the edge, and then you can kind of mix it so that way you still have your original color if you need it again. And then now you have your lighter white, lighter gray. And we're basically going to fill in the remaining of the canvas space of his chest here with this light gray. Whoops grab the darker instead and then we'll go in and we're actually going to place some pure white on top of this so by putting this light gray first it is hopefully going to make that uh, white stand out a little bit more because if we put white on a white canvas there's no contrast there's no reason for it to stand out so if we put this light gray and we did the variety the two shades of light gray um, that helps give us kind of a base and now I'm going to wipe the brush off. I'm going to grab a good chunk of the white because the lighter colors do get eaten up into the wet on wet blending compared to the darker colors. And we do have a good light source hanging out here on that right hand side. 
I'm going to try to go a little heavier handed and I'm going to take a look in the screen in just a minute on my phone to see if this is showing up for you guys at home. Sometimes it is really hard to see on the videos um, the subtle differences between the white, light gray, and even medium gray. Okay, it's kind of showing up, not too bad. Okay, so while we let that dry a little bit, we are going to move into I'm debating on whether jumping right into the orange. Let's go ahead and do the orange and then we'll come back and do one more layer on the green. So this will likely probably be a 45 minute uh, little demo. All right, so what we're going to do first is we're going to start with a orange and red mixture and it's more just um, so the red will thicken that up a little bit. So we're going probably like a three to one. So three parts orange to your one part red. There we go. So this is what we call burnt orange. It was one of my favorite colors for a long time. And we're going to fill this whole area in and then we will put some highlights and shading on it. And again, because I'm using the student grade paint, uh, I'm going to try to apply this a little bit thicker so it's a little more opaque. So I don't have to do the second coat on it. But here it's definitely going to be really cool. Take your progress picture before you add this color. Um, because as we're getting into the complementing colors of red and green, it is pretty cool how this pops. And we were talking about that in the demo yesterday. Just how certain color combos you're drawn to how awesome they look, and even kind of just how they make you feel. And it comes down to a lot of the complementing colors. All right, and if you even have to mix your shade a second or third time, it doesn't have to be the exact same shade, because like I said, we're gonna put a few colors on top. And if you need to, overlap a little bit of that leaf, overlap those original lines. And again, if you're on a stretched canvas, can carry that color over the side, just so it looks even more awesome hanging on your wall. And when you carry the color around the side, um, it gives the viewer a hint, the brain picks it up as a message, that there's so much more going on outside of the canvas um, compared to what you captured for your painting. So it just makes it uh, more believable, more realistic, and just a better impression. All right, and these brush strokes are showing up a lot. That looks like he's got some gloves on. Okay, so for the highlights, I'm actually just gonna grab the yellow because it's gonna diffuse very quickly. And just like in the other areas, I'm gonna place it and then squish it into the paint. So we've got little highlights on those little sucker fingers. And like I said, this is going to get diffused very, very rapidly in that color. So again, wipe that brush off. And then with that light pressure, you'll see how quickly it diffuses. And if you need to, reapply your yellow a little bit thicker. And then less movement as you're blending it in. You will find your balance with this. And it may be a little different than how I'm applying paint. That is okay. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Glad you like it. And V, glad you found the color wheel and glad it was helpful. Awesome. And the color wheel is a, just kind of a basic concept, but it's something that you can reference for your entire painting career. Um, and I will be developing some more limited color um, options and I guess courses. So kind of like today we were talking about complementing colors. I will start developing some specific uh, videos and courses to dive into limited color palettes. All right, so I'm actually going back up to that orange and red mixture and I'm adding more red because this is a red-eyed tree frog. And we're going to fill in the whole section except this little catch light and this little catch light. So again, um, 
if this is too much for you, kind of treat your brush like a pencil. Go slow. Remember to breathe. And if you need to, for some of those super small spaces, grab a toothpick or a paper clip. You could unfold the paper clip and you can use that. It's a bit more of a rigid surface to get into some small, tiny areas. And I like it when you use unexpected tools like the toothpick or the paper clip or the sponge or your fingers. So don't be afraid to get untraditional. And remember to breathe. I don't think I've told you guys to do that today. I forgot. Sorry. Take a big inhale. It's usually when you get into the smaller spaces and you got to be a little more controlled with your brush strokes that I'm like, oh yeah, we got to breathe. Alright, and that went on a little bit thicker. The red's a bit more opaque. But we're still going to add a little bit of shading in with that as well. So this one we're going to use the orange. Actually, as I'm looking at the photo, yeah, these are the cool ones. So we're actually going to take the yellow and we're going to kind of go around the perimeter of that pupil, that black pupil, and then we're going to diffuse this into it. So it's cool looking on the... So this I'm actually going to overlap a little bit of that white highlight. And I'm going just along the pupil, wipe that brush off, grab a little more yellow. We're going to go along the other side. We will come back in and reapply that pupil. And it does look kind of weird right now. That's okay. Wipe that brush off. And then with light pressure, I think it'll be a little easier to see it on this one. We're going to take that and just kind of squish it into the red and blend it away from the pupil. So like I said, that light, that yellow gets diffused quickly, so it doesn't take much pressure just to squish that into the red. And it doesn't have to stay that solid yellow. We're just basically changing the gradation of it. And if you end up doing that and you use too much pressure, just grab your paint again, reapply. And again, you're just, you're, you're building a lot of information in your brain and your muscles on how to hold your brush, how much pressure, what it looks like to mix your colors. So be kind to yourself when you're feeling the frustration starting to rise. And that is unfortunately part of the process. So learning to dive back and um, be accepting of yourself for where you're at. So for these catch lights, they're actually not pure white, but they are lighter. Um, on those glassy eyes. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make a orange and yellow and white mixture. We might add a touch of red. Let's see. Yeah, let's add a tiny amount of red just so it's not a huge contrast from the rest of the eyes. There we go. So I guess it's going to be end up being the orange, red, and white mixture. And let's see, we may adjust. So it looks one way here. Let's see if it's going to be enough of the shade I'm looking for. We are going to leave it white where it goes over the black of the pupil. And again, if you paint it over that, I'll show you how we'll just reapply it. But again, we're just giving a little indication that we've got a lighter surface, a slight reflection on this eyeball. And I'm thinking now that this guy might actually look good with uh, his bold black outline. So I think we'll do that today. All right, so I'm actually going back to the yellow and green mixture. We're getting one more coat on there. I'm gonna hide that in there. And then we'll do the black of the pupil and the white catch light, black outline, and that should bring us into the conclusion of today's painting. All right, and as far as framing a flat canvas, um, frames are totally personal choice because there's so many different styles out there. The panels are nice um, because they are flat and they can sit fit in your standard size frame without any extra hardware. Um, and they do, they look nice. They will change the feel of it. So get what's appropriate for your style. Um, you can stretch 
a frame, uh, you, let me say that backwards. You can frame a stretched canvas. You just need a little bit of extra hardware to compensate for the width of the stretched canvas. But yeah, uh, framing is totally a personal choice and everybody's got a different style. So I personally don't frame my stuff unless I'm keeping it forever. Um, and even then I prefer gallery wrapped, uh, the real thick with the like two inches thick on the edges and then the image going around it. So again, just making that yellow with touches of green, applying one more coat on here and then I'm gonna do the same blending. But even just with adding that extra layer right there, it's so much more solid, much juicier color. So I would recommend doing one more coat on your leaf as well. I probably will not do that for the demo, but I recommend that you guys do that at home. And even though I'm going over the parts where I did the shading on the first layer, because it's there, it's still keeping some of the structure. And we will go back in and apply that shading again to this layer. And if you do step up and start working with artist grade paint, you will not have to do this second layer because the paint is nice and thick. Um, I painted a logo yesterday with it and I forgot just how nice it is to work with. And then I got it done in one coat, one layer. But student grade paints are great to start with. They're not a huge investment compared to artist grade paint. So you can paint a little bit, make sure that you enjoy this as a hobby before you start purchasing a bunch of uh, new materials or expensive supplies. All right, so while I'm gonna go ahead and do the shading on this one. Again, just to kind of show that if you have paint that's drying fast, just work in small sections and you can still accomplish a great deal. Oh, actually, let me get this part down here too. Almost forgot about it a second time. All right, so I'm gonna grab that green, basically place it in the same area that I did before. Wipe that brush off. And then again, just with your light pressure, blend that into your base color. And before we added the second layer, uh, we had what we called the underpainting. And that's where there was no canvas space showing. And that's really when I feel like a painting begins, when I have gotten rid of all the canvas space. Because then when you go to lay your colors on top of it, with that color theory that I was talking about, we interpret it differently now that this is the base coat compared to applying this paint on um, a white canvas. So don't get upset if you do have to put a couple of layers on there. There is benefit to adding layers. I'm gonna add some yellow now for a highlight. But basically just find your creative time and it's your escape from the world for a little bit. So again, I'm just kind of placing this yellow where the highlights are and then I'm gonna go back and blend it in. And if you prefer to use white, you can do the same thing with the white instead of yellow, totally your call. You would get a slightly different uh, green look if you were using white instead of yellow. All right, so now I'm gonna go back to those arms, get those in there. And then we'll get our black, move on to the pupils and our black outline. All right, and we have another question on there. If I would provide a link to my reference photo. Um, 
I don't usually provide links to that just because I am using somebody else's photograph and I do not have their permission. Um, if it was my own photograph, I would show it, but because I did not get this photographer's photograph, I will not. And when you are at home and you are using other photo references that you find online, um, there are a couple copyright things and I was actually going to discuss it in tomorrow's painting for the fruit basket um, because when I was searching for a fruit basket, I saw the original photograph that was taken and then I saw four or five paintings that were done almost exactly as the photograph. They didn't change colors, they didn't change anything, and that is a copyright violation. So on here, I've actually already changed three things. Um, there was not a blue background. Um, there wasn't this extra leaf here. And actually, that's about the only thing that I've changed at the moment. Um, and the eyes are a little bit more red. So I do try to change at least four or five things when I grab other people's artwork. Um, but when you grab and use other photo reference items and you recreate it, you do change the copyright because you're creating it in your hand and you're changing the aspects. But if I went to try to sell this and the original photographer goes, hey, that's my composition or that looks exactly like my photo, I could get sued. Um, because of that, I also, that's the other reason I don't show the reference photos. Um, Maybe I'll start doing some demos to where you guys send me your photos and I'll recreate those and then I can show the reference item because I'd have your permission. Um, but right now, let's see, actually most of it got done. So it looks like we didn't have too much that left off. As I'm learning all of this, we definitely learn from video to video. Okay. So it looks like we're back on. I'm not quite sure how much I missed or when the phone cut off. So I'm just going to finish up these last couple of highlights. And yeah, so, so sorry about that. All right, so we're just going to put a few more little white highlights on there. And then that actually brings us to the conclusion of the video. So if you are catching this on the replay, I apologize for the uh, break in service. Like I said, my phone, I didn't realize I'd actually gone for an hour for the demo and my phone could not stay uncharged that long. My speaker, my mic has to be ch uh, plugged into where the battery, uh, the charger goes. All right, so like I said, just a few little white highlights on here and then that will be the end of the video. And I will catch everybody tomorrow for the next demo. I'm just using kind of light pressure, little wispies of just the whites, nothing super solid, but again, just helps give a little indication of where the light source is coming from and breaks up that space a little bit. And helps give a little touch of movement. All right. Okay, so again, very, very sorry for the technical mishap of my phone dying, um, but hopefully you guys can still finish the video and pick it up where it left off or where you left off painting. So thanks to everybody that came and hung out this morning. Awesome questions. Uh, tag me in social media, paint with Lovejoy, email me your photos, keep painting, um, keep finding your outlets, and I will catch up with you guys tomorrow. Cheers.